الحمد لله رب العالمين وأصلي وأسلم على من بعث رحمة للعالمين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين وبعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته So we continue with the tafsir of Surah Al-Baqarah from verse number 80 I'll give you a brief um, translation summary first of the verses I've just recited Verse 80, 81 and 82 Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says and they say the fire shall not touch us but for a few numbered days say have you taken a covenant a contract from Allah so that Allah will not break his covenant or is it that you say of Allah what you do not know rather indeed whosoever earns evil and his sin has surrounded him they are dwellers of the fire they will remain therein forever and those who believe and do righteous deeds righteous good deeds they are dwellers of paradise they will dwell therein forever so remember last week we talked about that amongst them Bani Israel there were those who were unlettered and they were relying on they didn't know the book they didn't know the contents of the guidance what were they relying on? Amaniya. Wa inhum illa yadunnun. Amaniya and dhan. They were relying on conjecture and wishful thinking. Wishful thinking and uh, conjecture, meaning that they were making things up from their own desires. This is what we were talking about last week. So now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us an example and telling them highlighting, pointing out to them one of the worst types of wishful thinking, one of the worst types of desire and making things up about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, about his actions, about what he will do or what he won't do, about what will happen on the day of judgment, about who will go into the hellfire and who wouldn't. This is an example now, a clear case of one of the terrible types of wishful thinking. When people start making things up, from their own selves. What is it they're making up? The wishful thinking here is that they are saying, لَن تَمَسَّنَ النَّارُ إِلَّا أَيَّامًا مَعْدُودًا They are saying that the fire will never touch us. Who are they? Some people from amongst Bani Israel, they are saying that the fire will never touch us. The hellfire, we will never, in other words, they're guaranteeing, they're saying that the hellfire we are not going to be put in the hellfire. The fire will not touch us, never. Lan tamasana. It will never touch us except ayyama ma'duda. Except for a few days. Except for a few days. Some people said they mean about 40 days because this is the period of time or the number of days that they actually uh, were worshipping the calf. So they said these 40 days is referring to that. Some people said it's less, but whatever it is, it's, it's a few days. They're claiming the fire will not touch us except for a few days. Now, why are they saying this? How are they saying this? This is where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is highlighting the result of wishful thinking. Once you start making up things about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, about the deen, about religion, about the ghaib, what will happen on the day of judgment, about how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will judge. Once you start making these things up, as opposed to following the guidance, as opposed to following what is in the Quran, as opposed to listening and obeying to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself has informed us, or going against what the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa has informed us, then what happens, it leads to stupidity. It leads to darkness, ignorance. It leads to things that go completely against all logic. How can somebody say, how can somebody guarantee that they will only be in the hellfire? As though that is a good thing. Do you think that's a good thing? Even if somebody says, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us a guarantee, we're going to be in the hellfire for 40 days. Is that something to be proud of? Is that something good? First of all, who can bear the fire of the dunya for even a few seconds or even a few minutes or even one small part of the fingertip, fire on the fingertip for a few seconds, nobody can bear it. 
For a few minutes, nobody can bear it. Never mind a few hours. Never mind the whole body burning. Never mind a few days. And this is, we're talking about the fire of the dunya. And we all know in the hadith, it's reported that the fire of the hellfire is multitudes, many, many, infinitely hotter, infinitely hotter than the fire of the dunya. So how can anybody think that this is a good thing? This is something to be proud of. This is something we accept. This is something we look forward to. Or, you know, this is we're chosen and, and this is it. We're going to only spend a few days. It doesn't matter. As though it doesn't matter if you spend a few days in the hellfire. How can you come to that conclusion? The way you come to it is because you lost all sense of thinking, of reflection, of logic, of intellect. Why have you lost that? Because you are following your desires, amaniya. You are following wishful thinking. These are your wishes. Where do they stem from? Your desires. Why? Because it goes against the guidance. Guidance tells you to go against your desires. Guidance tells you, in this case, guidance is telling you to follow Muhammad Guidance is telling you to accept Muhammad as a prophet, as the final messenger. Guidance is telling you to accept the Qur'an as the final revelation. But because you are following your desires, you are following your own created wishful thinking, your own whims and desires, and your own conjectures, this is how you are blocking all reasonable thinking. You are blocking your intellect, you are blocking sound judgment. And therefore you end up in, a, in things that are laughable, that are stupid that are unacceptable logically. How can somebody say, it's okay, we're just going to burn in the hellfire. First of all, the heat, we, nobody can bear it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, sometimes he says, uh, a day in the sight of Allah is like, a, a day in, with Allah compared to your days is sometimes like 50,000 years. So if somebody said, yeah, it's just a few days, we don't know how long those days are in the, in the next world. So if you say a few days, it could be hundreds and hundreds and thousands of years. So what happens is when you follow your desires, you end up losing your intellect. You end up losing your sound common sense, sound judgment. And then what happens, you start to defend it to justify it. You start to defend, what are they defending? What are they justifying? They're justifying not following Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They're justifying not accepting Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as the messenger. Remember Surah Baqarah, is, a lot of it is about establishing the proofs for the messengership, the, the prophethood of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which signifies the change from Bani Israel, from Ahlul Kitab to the Muslim Ummah in terms of leadership of revelation, leadership of prophethood. Leadership of guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what is it they're not accepting? They're not accepting what the Prophet is saying about following Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, about the Quran, about himself as someone who's sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So their conjectures, their amani and their dhan is leading them to this conclusion. They're defending it by saying, we are saved. You know, we don't need your deen. We don't need your messenger. We don't need your book. We're saved already. We're only going to be in the hellfire for a few days. And this is the stupidity of the argument, that this few days nobody can bear. How can you say that you're going to be in the hellfire for a few days? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, first of all, when they claim this, that the fire shall not touch us except for a few days, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, first of all, He questions them. He negates that. How? He says, قُلْ أَتَّخَذْتُمْ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ عَهْدًا فَلَنْ يُخْلِفَ اللَّهُ عَهْدًا أَمْ تَقُولُونَ عَلَى اللَّهِ مَا لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, first of all, he says, say, addressing Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, say to them that have you taken a contract with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for what you are claiming. You're claiming you're going to be saved except for a few days in the hellfire. Do you have something written down as a contract or do you have a promise from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guarantee this? 
Have you taken a covenant with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to promise you this? Because if you had, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would never break his promise. If you had a promise, an agreement from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that you will only be put in the hellfire for a few days and then you'll go to Jannah. If you had that, fine. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He would never ever break His covenant. He will never break His promise. But you don't have that. This is the question. Have you taken It's not a real question. It's to deny their claim that they will be put in the hellfire for only a few days. Not only that, then further addition is that or are you saying the, about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that which you do not know meaning you have no knowledge of how many days you will burn in the hellfire you have no knowledge of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will do with you but you're still claiming this this is the truth the last bit is actually what they're doing they are saying something about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without any evidence without any basis of knowledge this is in fact what they are doing One of the things, just from, these, just from this ayah we can take, number one is that no one can guarantee you safety from the fire except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nobody, regardless of who they are, nobody can guarantee you safety from the hellfire except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? Because He is the sole judge. He is the only one who will decide who goes to paradise Who goes to the hellfire? Someone might say, well, what about the prophets, alayhim as -salam? They will also send people to paradise. They will also intercede. Yes, they will intercede, but even their intercession is only those things approved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah subh ultimately, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as we all know, He is the only judge on the day of judgment. So none can decide, no one can guarantee entrance into paradise no one can guarantee safety from the hellfire except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala number two Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never ever breaks his promise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always speaks the truth there are no in it's not don't want to use the wrong words but let's say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it, it's it's as though if we say it's impossible for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to break his promise Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala repeats this many times in the Qur'an. And any truthful, the truthfulness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is self-evident. He, he does not lie. He doesn't break promises. Now people are of two types. Who, the, from the creation, if you compare with the creation, people are of two types. People make promises. They will guarantee you something. And then they will deliberately break that promise. They have a contract with you in business. You've signed a contract and deliberately, knowingly, they will break that contract. Deliberately, knowingly, they will break that agreement or promise. This is one type of people. There is another type of people. They make the contract with you. They promise you something. They don't deliberately break that promise. They try their best, but external circumstances, external factors lead to them breaking the contract. So it's something outside of their control. It's not something they did deliberately, but both result in the same thing. What does it end up in? The contract is broken. In other words, what we are saying is that no human being, no creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can ever guarantee anything for the future. Simple as that. Anybody who promises anything, either yes, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them the tawfiq to fulfill it, they will fulfill it. Or they will break that promise from their own will because of self-interest or something else. But nobody can guarantee to fulfill their promise. It's only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is above these two conditions, above these two situations. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never ever breaks His promise. And number two, nobody can prevent, nothing can prevent, no circumstances can prevent, no creation can prevent Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from fulfilling his promise. So these two conditions, you cannot find it in the creation. People, there's nobody you can say who never lies. Apart from messengers themselves, 
you can say, who, who never lies and nobody can stop him fulfilling their promise. Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If this is the case, we should reflect. We should reflect. We should put our trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We should invest our hopes, our, our, our dreams, our time, our resources, our priorities, our importance. All of this should be invested where? With Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If everybody, if every other human being may let you down because of one or the other reason, if this is the nature of the dunya, the nature of dunya is no matter who promises you what, when it comes to business or friendship or some other jobs or anything, no matter who, success, position, authority, whatever you're promised, whoever promises you something, they cannot fulfill it with a guarantee. If this is the case, this is the nature of the dunya. The dunya is a test. People will deceive you. People will break their promises. You will be let down by your desires, your hopes and your dreams will be shattered. This is the nature of the dunya. So we should turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Put our full hope and trust investment of our times and reward, uh, resources with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We should be patient with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We should not allow the other promises of the dunya that we have entered into in many, many different ways and in different circumstances, in different fields, whether it's in education or work or money or family or children, whatever it is, we should not allow those contracts, those promises to overshadow or neglect or for us to fall into neglect with remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or for us to prioritize less the akhirah. Those contracts, those relationships, those promises should not overtake this. Our focus, our hopes, our trust, our patience should be 100% with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is one of the uh, couple of good points and lessons from this ayah. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues. So he's negating their claim. They made this claim. Allah is saying, have you taken a contract with Allah for what you claim? Because if you did, Allah will definitely, 100%, it will be fulfilled. But rather, are you saying something without knowledge? Meaning, that's what they're essentially doing. Then, now to cement that further, to emphasize it, to confirm it further, He's now going to inform them, not only is their claim untrue, but now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will tell them what actually happens on the Day of Judgment. Not only is your claim not true, but rather this is the truth. This is what will happen on the Day of Judgment. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, بَلَا مَنْ كَسَبَ سَيِّئَةً وَأَحَاطَتْ بِهِ خَطِيئَتُهُ فَأُولَٰئِكَ أَصْحَابُ النَّارُ هُمْ فِيهَا خَالِدُونَ But rather, indeed, whosoever earns evil, سَيِّئَة, and his sin has surrounded him, they are the dwellers of the fire. They will dwell therein forever. These people said, we will dwell in there for a few days. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying, no, what will happen is, the people who have committed, who have earned an evil, will come into what, what is this sayyi'ah? Is it just one small sin? Is it a big sin? What is the sayyi'ah? Whoever earns the sayyi'ah and he is surrounded, enveloped, encompassed by his sin or his khati'ah, they are the people of the fire. They will enter or they will be there forever, eternity. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that it doesn't matter what you have wished, it doesn't matter what you have hoped, it doesn't matter how you think Allah will judge, it doesn't matter how you claim Allah will judge, rather this is the fact, this is how Allah will judge. Whoever commits a sayyi'a, whoever commits a sin, will discuss what that sin is. And then he's covered by it. He's encompassed by it. He's drowning in that. 
and then he comes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are the type of people who will be in the hellfire, number one. Number two, they will be in there forever, eternity. So now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is first negating their claim. Now he's establishing exactly what will happen. So the sayyi'ah, some people said that it refers to uh, a sayyi'ah al azima wahiya al-kufr. It refers to a big sin, a great sin, and which is kufr itself. So in other words, bala man kasaba sayyi'a means the one who has earned kufr, the one who has rejected knowingly after the truth has come to him or her, the truth has been made clear to them. And then they knowingly reject this truth, they hide this truth, they don't acknowledge it, they don't follow it, they don't accept it. The one who do, does this, and then وَحَاطَتْ بِهِ خَطِيئَتُهُ Meaning, he's completely covered by it. Why? Because it's continuous until the day he dies or she dies. They are completely surrounded by this act of rejection, by this act of denial. Once you deny the truth, once you've rejected it, once you've committed the act of kufr, then all your actions will be based on that. You'll be completely surrounded in your actions of kufr. And if you end up on the day of judgment in this situation and you come to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then there's no other way, place for you to go. You will be ending up in the hellfire. And if you die, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from that. If you die in a state of kufr, in a state of rejecting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, His Messenger, the Quran, the Day of Judgment, if you, if you die in that state where you reject the truth and you end up in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you will be in the hellfire forever. People who die without Iman, without Islam, it's not that they will be in the hellfire for a few days and then they're going to be entered into paradise. No. As these people were claiming, no, that's not the case. Now, some people may say, well, they also did good deeds. What about their good deeds, etc.? What the Mufassirun are saying here, the, the, the kufr of this particular group of people who were denying the truth as the truth was being shown very clearly in front of them. The Quran was being recited in front of them. The Prophet Sallallahu was there, right in front of them. They could see the truth. In fact, many of them said, we know that you are a messenger. They even acknowledged that. Many of them said, we know you are a messenger. But they were, they were just upset it's not from amongst them. They're just upset it's not from amongst them. Or they're upset it's not from a particular place. Or they're upset, you know, um, they're not going to be in leadership. They're going to lose out. They're going to lose out their benefits and their interests, etc., etc. So when, when it's that situation, the crime they've committed is one of kufr. And once you commit that crime of kufr, unless you repent, this will be your situation, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. And Abu Huraira radiallahu an and Ata and Al-Hasan and others, this is what they mentioned when they said that وَأَحَاطَتْ بِهِ وَأَحَاطَتْ بِهِ خَطِيئَتُهُ That their sin or their mistake or their big crime has covered them, right? What is it talking about? Abu Huraira said, this is shirk. His shirk has surrounded him. Meaning, those who commit shirk, same thing, kufr, shirk, different forms. Abu Huraira said, their shirk has covered them. Therefore, that is the result, meaning they'll be raised up on the Day of Judgment as disbelievers, as those who rejected Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Al-A'mash reported from Abu Razin, who said that al rabi bin Khuthayn, he said that whoever dies before repenting from his wrongs, this is what is meant here by those who are covered by their sin. Whoever dies before repenting. Others said it refers to the major sins, that those who are covered with major sins, this is what it's referring to. But the more accurate opinion 
Wallahu alam, is about kufr and shirk. Because we all know a believer who commits major sins, he will be entered into paradise after being punished. We all know that. This is a part of our belief that believers, Muslims, who commit major sins, and on the day of judgment, if their good deeds doesn't outweigh their bad deeds, then they will be in the, purified in the hellfire. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from that. And then they will eventually be entered into paradise. So it cannot be just those who commit major sins or those who died without repenting from major sins that they will be in the hellfire forever. No, that's not correct. Muslims will never be in the hellfire forever. They will be punished if their bad deeds outweigh their good deeds, but then they will be admitted into Jannah. So this is more likely the accurate opinion that this is referring to shirk, this is referring to kufr. But also, there's an important thing in this ayah. This may be talking about that group of people who said, we are going to be in the hellfire only for a few days. But does this exist amongst our people? Are there Muslims who also think in this way? Are there Muslims who think that, you know, I'm, I don't practice Islam. I'm a Muslim. Islam is in my heart. And inshallah, Allah will forgive me. Inshallah, when I get older, I'll do tawbah, make hajj. Allah will forgive me. There are many different groups and types of Muslims. There's a group who doesn't practice Islam and thinks that we are Muslim. Eventually, later, I will do tawbah and Allah will forgive me. There's another group who say, we don't practice Islam, but we are Muslim. Islam is in my heart. I'm a good person. I don't pray. I don't fast. I don't pay zakat, no, I haven't done hajj, I don't have to do all those things. Why? Because I'm a Muslim, I'm good in my heart, I believe in Allah, I believe in the last day, and I'm, good in, I'm a good person, that's what's important. I'm good at heart. So, inshallah, Allah will forgive me, and you know, I don't have to do X, Y, and Z. These two things are the definition of wishful thinking. This is... Amani. This is what they were saying. That we don't have to believe in this messenger, we don't have to believe in the Quran, because we've believed in Musa alayhi salam, we've got the our own books will be in paradise. These two groups of people, they're mistaken. The first group, they are disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They're going clearly against the guidance. What are they following? They're following their own desire. They don't want to pray, they don't want to fast. It's hard work, it takes effort, or they fear it will take effort. Actually, those who pray and fast actually enjoy praying and fasting. But they're ignorant, they probably don't know. Some people are ignorant, they don't know that they have to pray and fast. They don't know the severity, they haven't been taught this. But others, they know they have to pray and fast, but they just don't do it. They just think later on, I will make tawbah. But what's the guarantee? You will live for how many years? How do you know you will make tawbah? When you make tawbah, how do you know it's accepted? That's the first group. They're living on wishful thinking. This is amani. Same. Dhan. They're thinking. Conjecture. Number two, those who think that I'm a good person, Islam is in my heart, I don't have to practice it. Again, it's wishful thinking. You think, did Allah tell you that? Did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say, as long as Islam is in your heart, and you don't pray, and you don't fast, you don't obey any of my commands, you're fine, you're still a good person. Did Allah say that? Did the Prophet say that? No, nobody said that. Again, it's wishful thinking. Islam can never be in the heart, because Islam itself is a physical action. It means to submit, it means to surrender. The pillars of Islam are all physical acts, praying, fasting. You know, these are all physical acts, paying zakat, hajj. These are all physical, they're displayed or through your physical body. These are actions. They can't be just in the heart. Iman is in the heart, yes. But Islam can't simply be in the heart. Again, why is this? Wishful thinking. Making up their own view of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said or what the Quran has said. Then you have a third group 
And there's many different types. There are, there are Muslims, many of us may fall into this category, who are practicing, who are praying, who fast, who've done Hajj. But yet, we become relaxed. We do try and pray, we fast, we try and obey the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But in our journey to the next life, in our, we're all on a journey, we don't know how long we're living. Some 60 years, 50 years, 40 years, 70 years, we don't know. But on this journey, many of us become relaxed. We think, I've done Hajj, I pray regularly, I'm a decent person, I've made it. I don't feel that fear that maybe I haven't made it. Maybe I'm still destined for the hellfire because I haven't done enough. People become very relaxed. People become very reliant on their deeds. That I've done this, I've done that, I give charity. The, the fear is taken out. We become uh, relaxed about it. We become so sure that, subhanAllah, I'm, I'm okay. We have that at attitude. If, you, if somebody asks you, you'll never say that to anybody. But I'm talking about the attitude we have. We're not striving for more. We're not fearful. We're not making that sincere tawbah on a daily basis. The Prophet said, I seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more than 70 times a day. We're not in that mode. Umar radiallahu an, he said, I wish I was a blade of grass. I wish I was a blade of grass just cut. You know, no judgment, no hellfire, no paradise, nothing. This is how much they used to fear death. This is how much they used to fear the judgment because they don't know what their position is. And these are people who have been promised paradise. These are people who have been promised. Same with Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. Same with the Sahaba. They used to fear. They don't know where their final resting place is. They have no idea where their final resting place is because of humility. Because they don't see their actions and deeds as anything big. The, the, the tabi'een, the, the followers of the Sahaba, the next generation, they used to say, we used to know a people who didn't give any value to speech. We used to know a people who didn't give any value to speech. Meaning, they used to only value action. Today we become complete opposite. We talk a lot, we're texting, WhatsApp, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. All of this just full of advice, advice, do this, Quran verses, hadith. Many, many different things. I'm not saying that's all bad, it's good. But we see a lot of talk in our age. And the tabi'een are just the next generation from the Sahaba. Already by that time they're saying people are talking too much and acting less. The Sahaba were people of action and of less speech. They hardly used to talk compared to their actions. They were people of action. They were striving hard in their salah at night. By daytime they were working. They were giving charity, they were helping others, they were striving for the deen, they were establishing Islam. They were people of action. We've become people of talk and becoming relaxed. We think, alhamdulillah, I'm practicing, I do my salah, maybe I, I've made it. Not that we think that really, but our attitude, our action says that. We know inside that there's no way that we can guarantee that we've made it, but our actions the way we are last to do good deeds, the way we're not spending enough in fi sabilillah, the way we're not striving to establish good deeds, the way we're not making tawbah and istighfar, the way we're not crying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the way we're not prioritizing akhirah over the dunya, all of these actions is speaking and saying that we've made it. We've made it. So this is also another category this is very dangerous. We must be concerned until the last breath. We must be balancing between fear and hope, without a doubt. We shouldn't be so fearful that we can't act, we can't do anything, we can't live life. No. Islam is a balance between fear and hope. Yes, they say hope should be slightly higher than fear, slightly higher. It, sh it should be equal, but the hope should be slightly higher. Why? Because one of the hadith, the Prophet said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, 
أنا عند ظني عبدي بي I am in the opinion of the slave meaning I am as the slave thinks I am if you think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is forgiving and merciful and he will forgive your sins then this is how you will find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if you die thinking believing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not forgive your sins that he will punish you that he is not going to forgive you then that's how you will find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so they said always have a good opinion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always have a positive opinion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always have that hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive you but the difference of this hope and and between this uh, wishful hopes or uh, wishful thinking vain hopes is that you act is backed up by good deeds is backed up by striving meaning you do your best and then you have a good opinion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala every son of Adam will sin will make mistakes the best of khairul khattain at the best of those who make mistakes the best of those who sin are those who make tawbah return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they will never do this again they seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so the main thing is that you strive you will make mistakes but you keep on making tawbah but with the hard main thing is to give your 100% if we are doing this throughout our lives we try our best then we have the hope we must put that hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that inshallah Allah will forgive me I know I'm weak I know I haven't fulfilled the commands as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted me. I know I commit sins day and night. But I'm striving, I'm trying my best. And I know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that he will be in, in his slave's opinion. He will be as I deem him to be. If I believe he's Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, Al-Ghafoor, you know, he will forgive me, he's oft forgiving, he's merciful then inshallah I will find him like that on the day of judgment. So this is the combination we need to have, hope and fear. But the hope must come with full striving, full effort. If there's no effort, if there's no striving, and we have hope, it completely goes against guidance. Always remember that our desires, our wishes, normally, often, go against guidance, go against wahi, go against the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there must be striving, there must be effort, there must be doing the good deeds, implementing the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then with, on top of that you have that hope. And this is the situation we must be throughout our lives. And one of the good advices from Ibn Qayyim al jawziyah is that, you know, how do you maintain this? How do you do this? Because life is so long, you don't know how many years you're going to live. You've got the past, you've got the present, you've got the future. He said, as for the past, forget about that. Do tawbah and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive you and accept your good deeds and forgive your sins. Because the past is gone, you can't change that, you can't bring that back. The only thing you can change is through tawbah. That you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive your past. The future, you don't know what's going to happen. It's it's not your business, you don't have any control over the future. So all you have is the present moment. So live in the present moment. If you want to be in this state of hope and fear, of tawbah, turning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, strive now, strive today. Do that good action now, today. Not tomorrow, not next week. Because if you live for the moment, if you correct your actions, your position with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the current moment, in the present, then the current moment is lots of moments which make up the future. You will always live in the current moment, you never reach the future. The future is always ahead of you. All you ever do is live in the current moment. The moment moves. That is the future. But you living in the current moment, that is all you have control of. And that is the future, if you think about it. If you're always, if you say, I'm going to be good from now on, in the current moment, and you maintain that, 
That means you will be good in the future. That means you have set your way of being good in the future. So Ibn Qayyim al jawziyah he said, be you know, someone who takes the opportunity now in the present, live for the present. Change your habits now, change your habits today. Turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala today. Improve yourselves today, not tomorrow. Do it now. So this is the, one of the ways. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promises. He says, وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ أُولَٰئِكَ أَصْحَابُ الْجَنَّةِ هُمْ فِيهَا خَالِدُونَ Those who have iman, those who have believed and work righteous deeds, they are the companions of Jannah. They are the people of Jannah. هُمْ فِيهَا خَالِدُونَ They will be in there forever. And just reflect, take a few moments to reflect because sometimes we hear these words forever, khalidun, eternity, but we really don't reflect. We really don't reflect because just reflect and contemplate that what are we talking about? We're talking about eternity, never ending, millions and billions of years, the final abode. What is it we're sacrificing in this dunya? What is it? that the temporary nature of this dunya and the temporary delights of the dunya, the temporary gains of the dunya, how does that overshadow, overtake, overpower me and makes me lose something which is khayrun wa abqa, which is better and everlasting? How does that happen? We should reflect. Those who reflect strongly, those who constantly remind themselves that the next world, this that is the main goal. That is the thing of precious value. That is nothing can compare to that. If I lose everything in the dunya and I gain the akhirah, that is the supreme success. It doesn't matter what I lose in the dunya. It doesn't matter what I you know, forsake in the dunya to gain the akhirah. If we reflect and contemplate that the eternal life, because it's either the hellfire even if it's for Muslims, even if it's many, many millions of years, thousands of years, that's still a long time. It's either temporary punishment in the hellfire or a permanent punishment in the hellfire. And then it's permanency in the, in the Jannah. This is a big thing. It's, it's, it's the most single most important thing. It is the single most important thing in our lives. Yet, because of the nature of the dunya, because of the nature of insan, human beings, we forget. We prioritize dunya over akhirah. We forget the value of the akhirah. We, we value the dunya over the akhirah. This happens to all of us. But may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the tawfiq to reflect and ponder on his verses. And most importantly, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all the tawfiq to uh, act by what we have heard, by, to act by the Qur'an to the best of our abilities. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala join us all in Jannah, inshaAllah. Jazakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.